Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. I have the, the, the terrifying honor of taking over for Dr. Suzanne Mazur, who is not here today, and to introduce today's speaker. But before I start that, please, um, for the people who are out in WebEx land, please send in your questions on the chat and you address them to everyone and we'll, uh, we, will, uh, we will look at those after Dr. Bartlett's talk and a, an evaluation will come to you guys, so please fill that out as well. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Robert Bartlett, who has come here from the University of Michigan. Dr. Bartlett has uh, developed ECMO both through lab work and clinical trials. He did the first randomized controlled trial in babies and has been working on ECMO since before most of us were, were alive. We've known Dr. Bartlett for a long time. He started the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, which is dedicated to education and research, and it has a database that has been collecting data since the mid-1980s, so it was one of the very f first medical databases. And I actually tried to look up on Medline Dr. Bartlett yesterday, and it, the computer did that thing like a pinball machine where you, you, you tilt it, it got really mad, and all these lights went off, and so it just crashed. So I could talk about him all day, but it would be better just to listen to him, so I'll shut up. So this is Dr. Bartlett from Michigan. He is now a professor emeritus of surgery. Thanks, Tom, and thanks to all of you who are here, and many of you, I have learned, are here on Zoom or WebEx or some other electronic format, so we're, we're glad, glad to see you and glad you're here. And thanks to Tom for the introduction, uh, Tom and Mike McMullen and others that are here at Seattle Children's are friends of, of many, many years, so it's, it's just great to be here. Here's a little girl who's happy and healthy one day, dying the next day of influenza and streptococcal pneumonia in septic shock and profound pulmonary failure. And this is the kind of patient where we've exhausted all the usual things we have to do to treat these kinds of problems. And should she be a candidate for mechanical life support or ECMO? So the the question is, what's wrong with her oxygen delivery in relationship to her oxygen consumption? This little girl has a problem of systemic oxygen delivery uh, among a lot of other problems. So her metabolism is going on represented by the factory here and her, all of her tissues are consuming oxygen burning fat, carbohydrate, and protein at a certain rate, and we call that the basal metabolic rate or the resting energy expenditure, and it's measured as oxygen consumption per minute, or it can be converted to calories per day, for example, but the metabolism goes on but needs oxygen to run, and the oxygen that is used up is called the oxygen consumption, abbreviated VO2, and the oxygen gets there through the arterial blood. This is freshman physiology for all of you. Uh, so the amount of oxygen in arterial blood is called the oxygen content. Uh, and it has to do with the amount of hemoglobin and the amount of PO2 or saturation and the blood flow, which is the cardiac output. And the oxygen delivery is normally five times consumption. So there's a five times safety factor built in uh, in supplying oxygen to the systemic tissues. So this little girl has a problem with oxygen delivery and five times is plenty, but it gets down to two to one. That's the time when there's simply not enough oxygen to run the machinery and uh, acidosis results and so on. So our treatment for patients like this is to put them on high oxygen concentration, high pressures on the ventilator, lots of vasopressors, lots of drugs, and so on, uh, all of which are very effective treatment, but all of which are very damaging to the lung or systemic tissues. So uh, with extracorporeal support, we can avoid all those treatments which are inherently uh, dangerous to the patient. So the patient can be extubated, breathing spontaneously, no vasopressors, and that's our goal for managing this patient. So we do that by 
using what the ma machinery that we now call ECMO. It's uh, simply a modified heart-lung machine, but it takes over all the things in the red circle here so we can dial in the amount of CO2 removal, dial in the oxygen content, dial in the flow so that we can restore that five to one ratio, hoping that the heart and lungs will recover during the time that we're doing that. So this uh, technology is simply that, support of heart and or lung function with mechanical devices, which is temporary, days to weeks, nowadays to months, can be partial or total support, avoids ongoing iatrogenic injury from the ventilator or from vasoactive drugs, and simply sustains life while waiting for organ recovery or replacement. ECMO doesn't treat anything, it just buys time in order to figure out what the problem is and then what can be done about it. So the indications for doing this are pretty obvious, like this little girl, acute severe cardiac pulmonary failure, unresponsive to optimal management, with, in which recovery could be expected in a fairly short time. Uh, and the hard part is putting nouns into these adjectives. What is, what is optimal treatment? What is unresponsive? And so on. But we can figure that out for patients of all different age groups and primary diagnoses. So for me, this story starts at the Boston Children's Hospital in 1965, uh, and the chief of surgery there is Robert E. Gross in the front of the middle row. Uh, Dr. Gross uh, was in person just like he looks in this picture. Uh, uh, domineering, not quite, uh, but uh, uh, so, somewhat aloof and, uh, and, and masterful. We later learned he's really a shy person. Uh, if you got to know him personally, but an incredible surgeon who invented all of pediatric surgery, most of cardiac surgery. So m much of what we do in surgery is all related to Dr. Gross. This is your speaker here in the back row of the junior residents. This is Alan Gazaniga, who's another junior resident that I'll tell you a little bit more in, in a few minutes. But at the time, now, this was the very beginnings of cardiac surgery. So in the mid-60s, there were only a few places in the world that were using the heart-lung machine to operate on patients, all children, because you could only run the machine for half an hour to fix an ASD or something like that. And we would try it, and I say we, Dr. Gross and the other senior people in the front row here, would try to repair a tetralogy, for example, but the mortality was 50 to 80% in those children. And it turned out the mortality was so high because of the heart-lung machine. If you used it for more than an hour, uh, it caused lethal injury to the lungs and the heart and kidneys and other organs. So at a time when people had discovered um, silicone rubber, a material that would transfer oxygen and CO2 when made into a thin film, and there was an idea that you could build an artificial lung out of silicone rubber. So I went to Dr. Gross and said, why don't we try to build a membrane oxygenator, membrane lung, to see if it would solve that problem. Uh, and he said, good, why don't you work on it? That's mentoring, I've been working on it ever since. <laughs> In the 60s, uh, there were a few places that got working on this idea, and uh, the uh, first picture here is uh, the, a picture of a guy named Phil Drinker, who's an engineer at the Brigham and MIT, and we got assigned to work on this problem. We built membrane oxygenators, you can see in the background there, and what we learned was you could keep an animal on extracorporeal circulation for days at a time, not, not a few hours, but a couple of days. That was really important as it turns out. There were other labs that found the same thing, so that led to this concept of maintaining extracorporeal support for days at a time. Uh, the first clinical trial was in 1971, published in 72. This is a young man who was a trauma patient, ruptured aorta, fractures, and so on. 
who was treated by a surgeon named Don Hill using the Bramson oxygenator, which is what you see in the foreground there, and the first patient to recover. Uh, the same year we did this little boy here, we as myself and Al Gazaniga, who, uh, we, who was uh, post-cardiotomy for transposition. He had a mustard operation. No one remembers what that is, but pretty good operation. But anyway, myocardial stun post-op. And so we went over to our lab and cleaned up the sheep shit off our device and brought it over to the hospital and hooked it up and uh, he recovered. So the first cardiac patient, which was really important because that was the, the problem that we were trying to solve in the first place, cardiac malfunction. Uh, in 1975, uh, we treated this little girl who was, a, you can see, a nice full-term baby, but uh, profoundly hypoxic from what turned out to be persistent fetal circulation that did not resolve over time. And uh, she recovered after about a week and turned out to be a very important patient because the growth of this technology for the next 20 years or so was mostly in neonatal respiratory failure. The system we used is shown here. It's just veno-arterial bypass. Like being in the operating room, we drain blood from the right atrium and pump it through a membrane lung and then return it to the patient into the arterial circulation, veno-arterial ECMO. And this represents the number of centers involved in the red line and the number of patients involved over the next 10 years or so when this uh, technology started to grow. For that next 30 years of time, this became standard treatment in neonatal and pediatric cardiac failure and respiratory failure. There were about 30,000 cases during that time, about 1,000 per year. And we used the uh, Colobo oxygenator, which is a silicone rubber oxygenator, roller pumps and so on, and uh, clues together the rest of it. We were talking about that driving over here. We made vascular access cannulas out of chest tubes or nasogastric tubes and things like that, but it worked. Uh, and uh, there were a few centers that were studying adult ECMO for respiratory or cardiac failure, about 500 cases, but it was uh, not widely practiced. In 1989, we established the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization. This is the first meeting. There are about 100 people who were interested, mostly in neonatal ECMO, who showed up together to share our failures, mostly. What, what are the problems and what can we learn from each other? Turned out to be quite useful, so we did it again and again and now meet regularly, and that's what brings us to Seattle today. We're having the 34th meeting of ELSO, which is now getting to be a big deal worldwide. These are the ELSO member centers. Membership is by hospital, not individual people, but you can see that uh, the major hospitals, especially the major children's hospitals around the world, are all part of ELSO. And what ELSO does is to, first of all, uh, collect the data from those centers. So we have a, a registry of cases dating back to the first one. I'll show you more about it in a minute. And uh, also provides educational material, publishing uh, the definitive textbook on this technology and guidelines and running courses and things like that. So I told you that we this all went on for about 30 years, but in uh, about 2010, you can see an increase in the number of adult cases which now dominate the experience with this technology because there are a lot more sick adults than there are sick children, of course. And so uh, ECMO these days is used for respiratory or cardiac failure for uh, people of all ages. So the members of ELSO send their data into a central registry. These are the data as of last December, some uh, almost 200,000 cases in the registry in these categories, adult patients with pulmonary or cardiac failure, uh, 
pediatric patients and neonatal cases. These are the patients who survive ECMO, and the patients who survive to discharge. So the overall discharge ranges from 70% in neonatal respiratory failure uh, down to 30% in adult eCPR. eCPR is the use of ECMO in association with CPR for cardiac arrest. So uh, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a difficult group of patients, but we, it's really just cardiac support, but we report them separately in the reports of the registry. This is the registry report from just the last five years. So this is the most useful aspect of it to look at. So uh, this, as you can see, there are some 60,000 adult patients here, but only uh, about 10,000 children. And the use of this technology nowadays is uh, mostly in adult patients with cardiac or respiratory failure. So this uh, is an interesting fact that this technology has been studied in comparative trials comparing to the use of ECMO for respiratory failure compared to conventional care. Uh, there really are very few studies like this. There's never been a study of dialysis or mechanical ventilation or any other thing we do in the ICU compared to not doing it. Uh, but you can imagine the logistical and the ethical problems of trying to do a study of this life support technology because it's acute uh, failure, lung failure, uh, and the, but the endpoint is death. So if you do a randomized study, some patients are going to be assigned to a form of treatment that is going to be going to result in death more than the other treatment. So uh, it's it's a challenging issue. Uh, there have been 12 such studies over the years, and I just show you the reference there at the bottom, which uh, includes all of those particular studies and the problems of how to design a study of a life support in acute fatal illness. So that brings us up to where we are now. We use this technique for cardiac support uh, for uh, cardiac failure of various kinds, for respiratory failure, and we attach it a little differently for respiratory failure, or we can. And once the patient is on ECMO, cannulated, that is to say, then the management of the patient goes on for the next week, month, or even several months of time while we hope that the lungs or the heart will recover or perhaps be replaced by a transplant. I showed you this already. This is a veno-arterial access, just like standard cardiopulmonary bypass in the operating room. And we use the neck vessels for access, which includes uh, getting access to the right atrium through the jugular vein and perfusion into the aorta through the carotid artery. We, if you are new to this technology, which is to say in the last 30 years or so, that sounds a little scary. You're going to take the carotid artery of a patient and ligate it and cannulate it, but it turns out, as we learned in the laboratory, there's very ample collateral circulation to the brain, so it's just not a problem for neonates and even for adults. We did 60 adults with carotid access, although nowadays we more commonly might use the femoral. But this just is a demonstration of VA access. So it, it supplies total cardiac support and also total respiratory support. Here's a different diagram of the same thing, uh, draining blood from the right atrium, bringing it out, oxygenating it, pumping it back, in this case, uh, into the neck vessels, into the carotid artery. And we measure the things that are in the boxes here and use that to calculate oxygen consumption, oxygen delivery, the very problem we're trying to treat. So we use veno-arterial access f certainly for cardiac support. And so we talk a little bit about the algorithm for management of these patients. So a patient goes on uh, for profound shock, circulatory failure, uh, usually cardiac in origin, yeah, and um, oftentimes associated with cardiac arrest or brief periods of cardiac arrest. Uh, 
patients who are in extremis for, from the point of view of systemic perfusion. So the first question in managing those patients is how's the brain? Because the brain, as you might imagine, can sustain a lot of injury during the period of hypotension, cardiac arrest, and so on. So the management of a cardiac patient, whether it's a baby or an adult, is to wake that patient up right away in the first day or so and say, how's the brain? And if the brain is okay, that's great news. Now you're on to trying to improve the function of the heart. But if the brain function is not, if there's clearly significant brain damage, then the important thing is just to stop doing it then. Sooner or later, the heart might get better and you're left with a patient with profound brain damage who is just a vegetable. So, so we try hard not to do that. Sometimes hard to convince ECMO teams, you know, three days into it and the heart's getting better and so on, but the brain is dead, they should just stop doing it altogether. And the ECMO teams will learn about that. If the brain is okay, then the next question is, is the, how is the heart working? If the answer is, oh, pretty well, that patient's probably gonna get better. So a few more days, cardiac support, they'll be okay. If the heart's not working at all, then the question is, is that patient a heart transplant candidate? If the answer to that is no, for whatever reason, then uh, you're still gonna to have to turn it off, have a little discussion with the family. If the answer is yes, then you immediately put that patient on the donor list, put in a VAD, which you can do in pediatric or adult patients, and list the patient for a heart transplantation if you can find a donor, and that has now become fairly standard practice. A few things you need to know about cardiac support that are uh, unique to that uh, particular mode of support. Uh, if there's some cardiac function, that is the left ventricle is emptying uh, uh, along with, against the VA bypass, uh, then the, the blood coming out of the left ventricle might be pretty hypoxic if the lung is not working very well also. So you wind up with blue blood going to the head and red blood going to the feet and they're you have to solve that problem, it's pretty easy to do. On the other hand, if there's no cardiac function at all, the left ventricle is not emptying at all, uh, then you must do something to vent the left side of the circulation uh, by creating a septostomy in the atrium or in adults nowadays, we often use what's called an impella pump. It's a little axial flow pump that you can put directly in the left ventricle, but it's important to do because if you don't do that, in the first few hours, the left side will get over distended from bronchial venous flow and uh, make the heart worse. Nowadays, especially in uh, older children and adults, we perfuse via the femoral artery, uh, which interrupts blood flow to the leg. So you have to do something to maintain blood flow to the leg before leaving the bedside. You can use proximal access via the subclavian or the carotid artery, it works fine. And many of these cardiac patients are patients who just uh, can't come off bypass in the OR. I'm sure it never happens to any of the cardiac surgeons here, but maybe once or twice a year, there's a patient whose heart just can't come off bypass. So we convert those patients to ECMO for a day or two or three, and they usually recover quite well. So in cardiac, cases, these are the neonatal cardiac cases in the registry over time, about 10,000 nowadays altogether. And they have these diagnoses, as you might imagine, congenital defects, most of them, some in cardiac arrest, some cardiogenic shock, some myocarditis, even in newborns. And you'll see in these diagrams, uh, there are a lot of other diagnoses listed because someone filled out the registry form and said hypoxic or something like that, which uh, isn't a conventional diagnosis. Pediatric cardiac cases, there are about 16,000 cases in the registry. You can see it increases significantly every year. And again, the most common problem is uh, 
congenital defects or cardiogenic shock or a lot of patients in the other category. So that's cardiac support, and it's pretty simple, and the patients are not on very long and uh, works remarkably well for cardiac failure. For respiratory support, the algorithm is a little different. Uh, we put the patient on uh, for support on venoarterial access, usually for a newborn, for example, but most patients go on to venovenous access. We drain blood from the right atrium and pump it back into the right atrium where it mixes with the rest of the native venous return uh, and uh, it provides plenty of oxygen for the patient, although the systemic saturation will be about 85% or so because it's mixing with venous blood. Mix it, the venous blood mixes with the bright red blood coming out of the ECMO circuit. So we get the patient on, we turn the ventilator down to very low settings, we regulate the amount of flow through the ECMO system to make sure the oxygen delivery is at least three times consumption, and in a day or two, wake that patient up. So nowadays, we manage these patients fully awake, breathing spontaneously. Many are simply extubated or perhaps on CPAP or something like that. They don't need to be on the ventilator. Uh, and we just watch and wait to hope that the lung will get better over time. Having those patients fully awake is a little different than the old days for ECMO because now they, they communicate with us, they communicate with the family, and they can participate in decisions about their management if they're old enough to do that, certainly adults, but older children. So I'm telling you how we manage these patients, but in pediatrics, Neonates and infants are one thing, but there'll be 16, 17, 18 year old patients who we manage like adults, so you, so you have to be aware of the full spectrum there. So then we just watch and wait and uh, hope for lung recovery. Here it says can be in more than two months. It can be a lot more than two months, as I'll tell you more. And then when the lungs recover, recover, which happens quite quickly, then wean the patient off of ECMO and so on. So venovenous support is described here. We drain blood from the superior and inferior vena cava and take it out and oxygenate it and pump it back into the right atrium. You can also do this with two separate cannulas draining from the superior cava, reinfusing into the inferior cava, for example. We measure the things in the boxes and use that to calculate the oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. And uh, in pediatrics, we can do this as well. This is a 13 French double lumen catheter that's an appropriate size for m most neonates down to about uh, 32 weeks or so of gestation. And it's become a, kind of the standard way of managing these patients these days. As I mentioned, the uh, blood that's returned to the right atrium here mixes with the, whatever native venous return did not go through the ECMO system so that the resultant blood saturation, oxygen hemoglobin saturation, will go through the non-functional lungs and arrive in the systemic circulation uh, with those two different flows mixed, but typically about 85% saturation. So it takes a little learning to convince the ICU team it's really okay that this patient has a PO2 of 49 and a saturation of uh, 85%, as long as the hemoglobin is high enough to keep appropriate systemic oxygen delivery. And I mention that particularly because the biggest problem in adult ECMO, not in pediatrics, but is uh, docs who don't understand the physiology of oxygen kinetics, particularly the fact that the membrane lung runs on hemoglobin. So it, uh, it used, doesn't happen in pediatrics, so you don't, don't have to deal with this usually because the pediatricians understand this, the goal of hemoglobin is to keep it normal, which is to say 15 grams per deciliter. Uh, for some reason in adults, it's gotten to, to 
think it's okay to have patients who are profoundly anemic if they're really sick. Maybe it's even good. The sicker you are, the more anemic you ought to be. So there are, uh, you know, ma management principles to say you don't never transfuse someone whose hemoglobin is greater than seven or eight, something like that. So uh, to me, that doesn't make any sense. Eventually, that'll go away. But right now, it's a major problem in adult <laughs> intensive care in general. I hope that hasn't hasn't found its way to to you in this hospital over time. So again, in managing VV ECMO, we'd like to keep the ratio at five to one, but at least we, if we can keep it over three to one, that will mean the venous saturation about 60%. So when we're managing an ECMO patient, the only number we pay any attention to is the venous blood saturation, the drainage blood that's uh, coming back to the membrane lung, and we'd like to keep it around 60%. This is all thoroughly described in the ELSO literature, so uh, that's where you can find the further discussion of all that. So we're now in a phase that we call ECMO-2. This is what we did for many years here. Nowadays, we wake these patients up, we have them breathing spontaneously, not necessarily on the ventilator, usually without a tracheostomy. They can be managed by the ICU nurse with extra training in managing the ECMO system. There's still a need for the ECMO specialist team, but they're there for emergencies and to help out the bedside nurse. What we used to spend a lot of time worrying about lung recruitment by using high airway pressure for minutes at a time. Uh, all that does is create uh, pneumothoraces and bronchopleural fistulas, so we learned to stop doing that. Bleeding is still the most common problem but it's uh, mostly controllable these days. So in respiratory failure here, the neonatal respiratory cases in the registry, uh, and you can see there was quite a lot early on here, and then it decreased down to about 1,000 per year. What happened here? This is inhaled nitric oxide. So inhaled nitric oxide will treat that pulmonary vasospasm in a lot of patients, and so, uh, these are patients here who have failed on inhaled nitric oxide. And here are the diagnoses, uh, many different diagnoses, but the common one is diaphragmatic hernia these days. Used to be meconium aspiration where the survival rate was 91%. Still happens, uh, but with good perinatal care, doesn't happen as often as it used to. So dealing with diaphragmatic hernia is a significant problem. I mentioned these randomized trials. One of those 12 trials was the one described here. It was done in the United Kingdom in which uh, patients who were in 30 different neonatal ICUs who met criteria for severe respiratory failure either stayed where they were to get the best treatment in those hospitals or to be transferred to an ECMO center of which there are only three, and they compared the results, 70% survival to 41% survival, and that, that pretty well nailed down the idea that if, if you meet these criteria as a neonate, you need to go to an ECMO center to get care. I talked about diaphragmatic hernia, and uh, just a few things that, that are worth discussing. What are the indications, and we uh, obviously profound respiratory failure after birth from a diaphragmatic hernia patient. Nowadays, you can guess it's gonna be bad based on the ultrasound prior to delivery. Question is, once the patient's on, what's the best time to repair the hernia? Should you do it right away? Should you wait till the patient's off ECMO or somewhere in between? And uh, we, the algorithm at Michigan, at least, is to do the worst patients right away uh, most other patients we repair after they come off ECMO. Worst means liver up and size of the lungs and stuff like that. So the airway management of a CDH patient is uh, pretty simple. Just don't do anything to damage the lung even further. Uh, we have spent a fair amount of time using perfluorocarbon. I don't know if you know about that, but it's a, it's a uh, 
liquid material that's totally inert, like liquid Teflon, happens to carry a lot of oxygen, CO2. So one thing you can do to try to inflate that hypoplastic lung is to put fluorocarbon in the airway. There have been various studies looking at that. Uh, there's also been a lot of research on preventing the lung hypoplasia. As you know, or you should know, that the uh, amniotic fluid comes primarily from the lung. In the fetus, the lung is generating fluid and the, the baby, the fetus, breathes it out. Uh, and so if with diaphragmatic hernia, there's not enough lung there. If you occlude the trachea in utero, then that fluid collects in the lungs and will uh, improve the situation considerably. So that uh, that is the approach that's being used nowadays in many centers to occlude the trachea with a balloon in utero with the hope that uh, the hypoplasia will be somewhat treated by that management. So these are pediatric respiratory cases over time, as you can see, and the various <laughs> most common diagnoses here are other or someone listed hypoxia or something like that as the primary indication. One of the leaders in this whole area is the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. This is Polly Palmer who ran the unit there forever, and he wondered why should ECMO patients be asleep? I don't know why, they're totally supported. So he's the one who first started extubating patients. And I took this picture when I visited there. He, he said he was doing this. I must say I didn't believe it, but here they were. I'm you know, you know, playing video games with this little boy who is, has no lung function at all. So we have all learned from Polly. This is now standard practice around the world. So during COVID, we had a severe respiratory failure um, related to that particular viral infection. You might remember how frantic we all were in 2020, 21, uh, but it's just another viral pneumonia, so we learned to manage it. But these are the results with ECMO for COVID in uh, a couple of different waves. So this blue line here is the mortality rate of COVID patients on ECMO during the first wave, you might remember that was really bad, but the uh, survival rate was actually 63%, not too bad. The second wave, those of you who lived through this might remember it was much worse, uh, just a more virulent virus. So this is the mortality rate here in the same very experienced units. 52% uh, mortality, it went up because the virus was more, more virulent. Uh, this data here is the mortality rate for centers that were learning ECMO uh, on the fly, on the COVID patients. You can imagine how difficult that might have been, but even so, their mortality was 60%, 40% of people ultimately survived. So we learned a lot about ECMO in that particular pandemic. Now this red line here, this is the mortality rate for all ECMO patients at all waves at a single center, the Rush Medical Center in Chicago, which is uh, simply the best ECMO center in the world actually at treating respiratory failure in adults. These are all adult patients. So uh, why are they so good at it? Here's their COVID data. 70% survival in those patients when everyone else is at the very best 50% survival. For, so first of all, the average patient was on for two months of time uh, and their protocol was awake management, extubating the patients in the first week or so, minimal sedation, right atrio to pulmonary artery access because eventually all respiratory patients will most of them will get into right heart failure, so you have to have something to deal with right heart failure. Uh, but most importantly, they worry a lot about oxygen delivery, the very thing I've been telling you about, which means that they he keep the hemoglobin over 12 or 13 or 14 or 15 if they need that much hemoglobin to keep the delivery three or four times consumption. 
So uh, we talked about neonatal decisions and pediatric ECMO, the decisions that we have to make uh, are, well, first of all, a neonatal, uh, what's the lowest gestational age? What sort of preemie do we manage with ECMO? Nowadays, we, we usually cut off at about 30 weeks of gestation. What type of vascular access? It's all venoarterial, although it, it is possible to do it venovenous in neonates, the timing of CDH we talked about. In pediatric patients, a decision is whether to use the carotid, as we always do in neonates, versus the femoral, which we usually do in adults. And so if a child is six years old, 12 years old, 15 years old, when do we make the decision to use the femoral rather than the uh, carotid? Uh, we nowadays are using ECMO quite a lot for septic shock, and there are several studies on that. And then what level of hemoglobin do we manage these patients on? So finally, about all of that, what's the future of this particular technology? Well, we, we worry about the future in circulatory failure, in clotting and bleeding, and respiratory failure, particularly in very premature infants. So for circulatory support in the future, we'll continue doing what we're doing now. Uh, there's an interest in eCPR for patients who are in cardiac arrest in the emergency room, maybe even patients with uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Septic shock is also an interesting area. This is just one small study. There are many studies like this. And like the little girl I showed you at the beginning, People in septic shock and respiratory failure and shock uh, managed with VA ECMO, and in this particular series, 70% uh, survived to healthy result. Clotting and bleeding is still the most common problem in ECMO. Uh, the clotting, because it's a bunch of foreign material, which tends to clot over time. Bleeding, because we have to give anticoagulants to prevent clotting in the circuit. So uh, we use heparin primarily, although bivalirudin is also commonly used and works very well. The research in this area is focused on making the plastic surface non-thrombogenic so that uh, in our lab we're working on this concept. We have uh, plastic devices and oxygeners that secrete nitric oxide. So you know about nitric oxide acting on the pulmonary vasculature. It turns out it also prevents platelets from sticking to the surface of normal endothelium. So we can now make plastic that secretes nitric oxide that's quite effective in preventing clotting. There are a couple of adult studies. Here's one in which uh, patients on VV support for respiratory failure in adults, lots of patients, 30 per group, where they just stopped using heparin altogether. And what do you know? There's less clotting, there's less bleeding, less neurologic injury. And so we're uh, getting many centers to try to try to do this. In pediatrics, uh, we're interested in LGANs. These are extra low gestational age newborns of if you live in this world, you know this terminology. Babies that are born at 24 weeks, which we try hard never to make that happen, but it does, up to about 30 weeks where the results are very good. So uh, in those very much immature preemies, the uh, healthy survival rate is only about 20% if at age 25 weeks. It's quite good by 30 weeks. So there are two approaches to how to provide extracorporeal support, which are called artificial placentas. It's not really that. One is a group that we're doing at University of Michigan, and the other is a group at University of Pennsylvania. So the, our approach to this is, we've been doing this about 10 years now. This is George Michaliska's work. So we drain blood from the right atrium run it through a little mini ECMO system and return it to the umbilical vein. So it's basically venovenous ECMO. Uh, 
and we can put a lamb fetus on this system. And what we've demonstrated is the, that normal growth and development occurs, the lung develops normally, and we pick lambs that are 110 days of gestation. The important thing is their lung maturity is about like a 24-week human. And uh, this works quite well. We're getting close to commercial application of this. The other approach has been used at Penn. Uh, it's quite similar except that the uh, vascular access is through the umbilical vessels. So the umbil umbilical arteries drain into a membrane lung and the blood then goes back into the umbilical vein. Uh, uh, you can do that and put the whole fetus in a, in a plastic bag. So you might have seen photographs of this, the new artificial placenta baby in a bag and so on. Uh, they're, they're quite close to commercial development and are, are aiming for that starting, starting next year. Uh, because the umbilical arteries spasm so quickly, that you really have to do this immediately, not after the baby's born, but you have to do a C-section in lambs to uh, get to those umbilical vessels before they spasm. The same will be true in humans. So this would be a woman who's going into premature labor at 25 weeks, let's say, uh, and the idea is to try this, uh, but that requires a C-section and delivering that, that baby at that young age just to hook it up. Uh, our approach at Michigan is a little bit different. We think those babies should be born and then if they fail on mechanical ventilation, because occasionally some of them do very well, that's when we would go to this idea. But you're going to be hearing a lot more about the so-called artificial placenta for extreme prematurity. Uh, finally, uh, we have learned over time that uh, patients who are on VV or VA ECMO for respiratory failure uh, can be on for a long time with the lung recovery. Here's Tom Brogan's paper based on the registry showing 38% survival in cases that were on more than 21 days, pediatric cases, and there have been several similar reports and individual case reports running from 30, 60, 80, 100. And this little girl, who was on ECMO for 605 days of time, uh, her primary problem was she was in a house fire. She had systemic burns and smoke inhalation. This is her doctor who took care of her. It's happened to be at Hopkins, Chris Nelson. And uh, quite a remarkable case. As you might imagine, everything went wrong at one time or another. She was on VA and VV and ECOR and so on, lots of sepsis and so on. But she's alert and awake the whole time. So every week, someone comes around from administration or the other intensives, say, why are you doing this? This little girl's been on for a month, six months, a year. Why are we doing this? Well, she's alert and awake. Sweet little girl who's riding her tricycle around the ICU. And it's, it's, someone could quite bring themselves to turn her off. And what do you know, after 600 days, just she got better. And I just talked to her on the phone last week. She's now 16, she's learning to drive and stuff like that. Very articulate, because she spent two years only talking to adults, nurses, and so she talks like an adult. But uh, what the point is, and nobody wants to have a patient on for 600 days, and we need to have a a better way of, of getting off it. But the talk was, well, maybe we should transplant her, but she never was transplanted. Here, her lung gets better over time. So this is a new phenomenon in lung biology. We, we didn't know about this, but patients supported with ECMO uh, with no lung function at all for days, weeks, months of time can totally recover back to normal. That's, that's a new phenomenon. So uh, we're, we're just beginning to learn about this. Why does that happen? What's the biology? What sort of stem cells are there in the native lung that allow for recovery over time? A lot of research going on in that area. But one, one approach to this is to develop a wearable uh, 
membrane lung, ECMO out of the ICU. There are various ways to hook it up. This is what we're working on, pulmonary artery to left atrium access in a patient who was managed that way. It can be uh, conventional right atrium to pulmonary artery access. So uh, in the future, we'll be doing what we do now, uh, but what'll be new is simple automated devices so you don't have to think about whether to turn the sweep flow up or down or the blood flow up or down. And the applications will be all the patients we, we have now, including bridge to transplant and so on. For circulatory support, we'll be doing what we do now, except I think we'll be doing a lot more patients for septic shock, where the preliminary studies are pretty encouraging. And for respiratory failure, we'll be focused a lot on these very premature infants and also on what's called ECOR, low flow ECMO just for CO2 removal for end stage lung disease. So that brings us back to Serena, our little patient. Here she is. After a month on ECMO, lungs don't look good at all. What are we going to do? But uh, as often happens, a week later, suddenly she just gets better. This happens quite, quite quickly when it happens. So uh, she eventually uh, finds her way to hospital discharge. So that's the ECMO story, and I'm glad to share it with you and be glad to entertain any questions that you might have. He's asking about VADs for a bridge to transplant versus ECMO as a bridge to transplant. And we know a lot about this because of what's, what was called the Berlin Heart Study that we did using the registry. So the Berlin Heart is the only VAD for children. I think it's still the only one. Maybe there are more now. Uh, but they wanted to do, a, were required to do a randomized study by the FDA to get it on the market. But we knew that the results successful transplant with the Berlin Heart was about 90% in a handful of cases that had been done. We knew with ECMO it was about 50%, and with no ECMO at all, it was 100% so patients are all going to die. So we actually devised a study uh, that turns out to be quite important in the study design point of view because we compared patients managed with the Berlin Heart to patients from the ELSO registry children who were on ECMO awaiting heart transplant. And of course, the results with the Berlin Heart were much, much better uh, for various reasons. But part of it was they're just not quite as sick, but also they're managed a lot, a lot better than with all the complications of ECMO. So, so you're quite right. We would, uh, just as in adults, as I was mentioning there, as soon as it's clear that the heart is not working, but the patient is a transplant candidate, that's the time to go to a VAD, whether it's pediatric or adult. Do you think that there are any negative consequences on you know, kidneys and liver for long support on ECMO that you don't have on a VAD? No. As I said, we, I showed you all those lists of cases, hundreds of cases, including the 600-day patient and their other organs work fine as long as their systemic oxygen delivery is okay. Bleeding is a problem though, and sooner or later they get septic. So. Dr. McMullen and I thought just because you are so full of spirit, we would like to thank you for coming along. So we got you a little bit of spirits to, <laughs> to, to thank you for coming out and speaking Great. to us. Thank, thank you, you so much and thank you all for attending.